For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. kind of an emotionally reserved guy, but that made me want to sing hallelujah, didn't it? <laughs> and maybe even to shout hallelujah. Praise the Lord, and thank you, Kristen. Thank you, worship team and choir. It was beautiful. 
I, I can only imagine what it will be like when we get to heaven, when the angels of heaven are singing and the multitudes of heaven join in with them. What a glorious time that will be. It will be wonderful. Well, he is risen. He is risen indeed. And we're glad that you're here today on this Easter Sunday morning celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And if it happens to be your first Sunday with us, we'd like to encourage you to take one of the brochures, folded uh, pamphlets that look like this in front of the... Uh, in the seat in front of you, and then open that up. There's a card inside. If you would fill out that card and then drop that in the offering plate when the offering plate comes by later on during the service, we would appreciate having a record of your visit. Also, there are some mugs out in the vestibule and some videos. We'd like you to take one of each as a gift uh, to remember Grace Bible Church by and also encourage you, if you don't have a good Bible-believing teaching home church, to consider making Grace your home church. Uh, the only announcement that I really have this morning is to remind you that there is, there are no evening services. And so that includes uh, basketball, volleyball, uh, the young people's meetings, et cetera, et cetera. So we're encouraging you to, we know a lot of people have family in from out of town for the Easter holidays or you visit with family. We're encouraging you to spend time with your family and uh, celebrate the resurrection together. And so the only thing that we want to do this morning then during this time is to highlight our missionary of the week, which is listed on the back of your bulletin. This week it's the Christian Law Association. And so as our men come up to help us take up the offering, we're going to lift up the Christian Law Association in our prayers. Would you join me, please? Well, Father in heaven, we thank you for Dr. David Gibbs, the founder of the Christian Law Association, and those attorneys that have devoted their, their life uh, to serving you and and to do so, uh, do, do so on a voluntary faith basis, uh, not charging any fees to the churches or individuals that they represent that when there's a case concerning religious liberties, but simply uh, trusting the churches and other individuals to supply their need. And so, Father, we thank you that there are a group of lawyers uh, that are dedicated to that cause. And, and uh, we pray that you would bless their ministry and that you would supply for their needs and that they would be con they would continue to champion the rights of Christians and the constitutional rights that we're, we enjoy in this country. Father, we, we pray your blessings upon this ministry as well. We thank you uh, for all those who have a part in working so hard around here, doing so many different things. I thank you for them and their desire to minister. We pray, Lord, that Jesus Christ this morning would be lifted up, that he would be glorified, and that we would give him praise and honor and glory that he so rightly deserves. And we ask it in his name. Amen. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. <coughs> they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen, as he said. Romans 8.11 tells us, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who lives in you. I believe in the sun, I believe in the risen one, I believe I overcome by the power of his love. Because he 
I was dead in the grave. I was covered in sin and shame. I heard mercy call my name. He rolled the stone away. Amen. At this time, we have some special uh, music from a special guest. He's a relative of mine down on vacation and graciously agreed to sing this song that will lead into the message. So listen carefully to the words as Michael comes and shares with us. Secrets were in the light, and on this hallowed ground we've drawn the battle lines. And will we make it through the night? 
It's gonna take much more than promises this time. Only God could change our minds. Maybe you and I were never meant to be complete. Could we just be broken together? If you can bring your shattered dreams and I'll bring mine, could healing still be spoken and save us? The only way we last forever is broken together. Oh, how it must have been so lonely by my side We were building kingdoms and chasing dreams but left love behind And I'm praying God will help our broken hearts align And we won't give up the fight It's gonna take much more than promises this time Only God could change our minds Maybe you and I were never meant to be complete Could we just be broken together? If you can bring your shattered dreams and I'll bring mine Could healing still be spoken? save us the only way we last forever is broken together Maybe you and I were never meant to be complete Could we just be broken together? If you can bring your shattered dreams and I'll bring mine Could healing still be spoken and save us? The only way we last forever The only way we last forever The only way we last forever Is broken together Would you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, as we come to this time of the service, when we begin to look into your word and uh, talk about the, the reason why Christ came, and because of our brokenness, because sin has wrecked havoc on the human race and has caused us all to be broken. It's broken our relationship with you, and it's broken the relationship that we oftentimes share with each other. And so, Father, we pray that you would work, work in us this morning uh, to cause us to appreciate anew and afresh what Christ did when he came to earth and died on the cross for our sins and then rose again. We thank you for him and we celebrate him this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Michael just sang a song called Broken Together by Casting Crowns, which talks about how brokenness is a part of our spiritual condition that affects our relationships. As a result of our brokenness, we have faults and failures that we bring into relationships that can gravely affect our relationships. A part of surviving the hurt our brokenness causes each other is a recognition that we are all broken. And I am too, 
Boys and girls, you're dismissed to Children's Church. <laughs> We all have faults and failures. <laughs> if we are honest with each other, we will admit that, that we all have faults and failures, which may result in broken dreams and even worse, oftentimes broken relationships. But what does that have to do with Easter? What does the human condition of brokenness have to do with this Sunday morning and with Easter? Well, understanding our brokenness helps us to understand why there is an Easter, why there was a resurrection, why the crucifixion. It is because of our brokenness that Christ came to redeem us. We are all, in a sense, damaged goods. And I'm not talking about the brokenness that is caused by dysfunctional parenting and negative social influences, although that aspect of human brokenness is a direct result of the type of brokenness that I am talking about, the type that occurs because of sin. We are broken because of the results of sin. And the good news of Easter is that Jesus came to not only cure the cause of our brokenness, that is to defeat sin, but to give us the power to begin to mend the damage caused by sin in our lives. The Bible doesn't use the word broken in relationship to our spiritual and physical condition. And I think probably because broken really only describes the resulting condition and not the cause. For example, if I say that my car engine is broken, it doesn't tell you why it's broken. It may be that it ran out of oil, or it could be that somebody drove it other than myself and over revved it. Or maybe some evil person put sugar in the gas tank. And so saying that it is broken doesn't tell you why it's broken. It only tells you that it no longer functions correctly. The word brokenness also doesn't accurately describe the extent of our brokenness. Brokenness, again, really only describes a condition. For example, if we were to talk about a car engine again and say that it was broken, it, it, we may mean by saying it's broken that it has one bad ignition coil and so it skips. And we say, well, my car isn't running right, it's broken. Or it could be something worse than that. It could be a broken, a broken timing chain, and so it doesn't run at all. Or it could be something even worse than that. The extent could be even worse. It could be that it has a broken connecting rod, which would cost even more money to fix. And so broken, or the term brokenness, doesn't really convey to us the extent of brokenness. And so the Bible uses other language to describe those things. But brokenness, I think, accurately describes the result of sin in the life of humanity. We are broken. We no longer function correctly. We no longer function the way that God designed us to function. And not only do we no longer function the way God designed us to function, but our relationship with Him has been broken as well. And so we are broken in relationship to how we live life, and we are broken in the sense that our relationship with God has been broken. And so the Bible uses terminology that explains the extent of the brokenness and tells us the cause of brokenness. Humans are broken because of sin. We are broken and we don't even know it. In fact, the brokenness has so affected many of us that we deny being broken. Pride, arrogance, and dishonesty cause people to overlook their own faults and failures or to not admit to them. The worst part of our brokenness that is, is that it not only affects our relationship with each other, but it again affects our relationship with God. Sin has broken that relationship. We have become separated from a holy and just God by Adam's sin and by our own sin. This is why we read verses in the scriptures like the following. Psalm 51, verse 5. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden, hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. Isaiah 64, verse 6. All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Even the good things we do because we are broken are often done out of the wrong motive or for the wrong reasons. And so God says that even our, our acts of righteousness are like filthy rags. 
Romans chapter 3, verses 19, or verses 9 through 18, describe the condition in detail. It says this, What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Wait, wait a second, I'm an exception to this. Right? Isn't that the way we sort of feel at times? Oh, oh, what are you talking about? I seek after God. I, I try to do good. I, I'm the exception. No, the scriptures say none of us do because in our brokenness we even deceive ourselves. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And remember, he said, Jew and Gentile alike, all of humanity. All of humanity is so broken that we don't even realize it. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 goes on to say, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Until we give in to the convicting work of the Holy Spirit of God, these words are meaningless to many people because of their brokenness. The Bible says that the extent of their brokenness goes so far and so deep that we are said to be spiritually dead. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. We are so spiritually broken that we are dead to the things of God. We cannot understand the word of God correctly, and we don't understand the ways of God. The Apostle Paul, before his conversion, when he was still known as Saul of Tarsus, is a good example of how broken we are spiritually. Even the people who sometimes seem to have it all together, the bright and the powerful, the rich and the successful, are just as broken, including those who are very religious. Religious people can be very broken. Saul of Tarsus was one of those, and we'll see that in a minute. But you know, sometimes we look around the world and we think, hey, that guy's got it all together. He's young, he's smart, he's successful, he's wealthy, he's made lots of money, he's good looking, he's muscular, he's fit, he's, he's got good health, he's got everything. Surely he's not broken. You ever, do you remember the name Jordan Belfort? Jordan Belfort. He was a former multi-millionaire, a multi-million stockbroker that for a while seemed to have it all. At the age of 25, he was reported to have made more than $250 million through his own stockbroking firm. There was a movie made about Jordan. It was called The Wolf of Wall Street. And Leonardo DiCaprio played the part of Jordan Belfort. In 1999, this young individual, 25 years old, who had made over $250 million, who by all accounts seemed successful to many people, pleaded guilty to fraud and other related crimes and spent 22 months in prison. And so here you have an individual who may have appeared to have it all together to some people and yet was guilty of fraud and other crimes as well. You see, all of us are broken. All of us are broken. I'd like to look this morning at Saul of Tarsus, who later became known as the Apostle Paul, as he relates his testimony to King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, verses 9 through 19, we can learn something about the condition of brokenness and how it's overcome. In verse 9, Acts chapter 26, verse 9, it says this. This is Paul speaking to King Agrippa. I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the saints in prison. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. I tried to force them to blaspheme. In my obsession against them, I even went to foreign cities to persecute them. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with authority and commission of the chief priest. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. 
Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant, as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. The first thing we can learn about the human condition, again, which I've already sort of alluded to, is that all of us, even the very religious, are so spiritually blind and broken that we often think we are doing what pleases God when in fact we may be doing the very thing that displeases God. Saul of Tarsus was a Pharisee of Pharisees. His dad was a Pharisee. He grew up in a religious home. He was trained under the greatest Pharisee of his time, the teacher Gamaliel. He says that he, he rose up into the ranks of the, the Jewish religious system to that of a Pharisee and said he was a Pharisee among Pharisees. And that as concerning the law, as concerning legalistic righteousness, he says he was faultless. And so here we have a man who was very, very religious, extremely religious. And yet, and yet he was doing exactly the opposite of what God would have him to do. He was persecuting those who believed in the Messiah that God had sent. And then he was putting them to death. And he thought that in the process he was doing God a favor. That he was pleasing God. That's how broken we are in our natural state. That's how broken we are because of sin. We are so broken that sometimes we think that what we're doing is pleasing to God when in reality it's exactly the opposite of what God would have us to do. Talk about mixed up. Sometimes we are mixed up. Paul, Saul, Saul of Tarsus was mixed up. But Paul is not the first or the last person whose spiritual blindness and brokenness caused him to do exactly the opposite of what the Lord wants. There are still people today in their spiritual blindness who think they are doing God's will by killing Christians. While many may not go to that extent in their misunderstanding of what God really desires, we see man's blindness in his attempts to earn his salvation by his own good works. And so there are people that think that they're working their way to heaven and that they're earning favor with God, that they're meriting salvation, when in the very process of what they're doing, God is saying, I'm displeased with you. You cannot earn your salvation. You cannot merit your salvation. You can't do enough good to get there. In fact, in Romans chapter 10, we, we see a verse that would, I think, directly apply to that kind of mindset when it says, in relationship to the Jewish people and their attempt to keep the law to earn salvation, it says this, Since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. In seeking to be righteous on their own terms and their own conditions, in seeking to please God in a way that they thought was right, in actuality, they were not submitting to God's way of righteousness. Why? Because they're broken. Why? Because of sin. We are all broken because of sin. Also, as a result of our sin, we are said to be condemned and on our way to hell. And so it's a serious dilemma that man finds himself in, a serious condition. So serious that there had to be intervention in order to bring salvation. And we see that in this text as well. And that intervention could only be made by the person of the living Christ. And so we see while Saul is on the ro road to Damascus, for reasons unbeknownst to us, we can theorize why God revealed himself, why Christ revealed himself to Saul of Tarsus the way he did. But the, real, the bottom line is we don't know. We may have some ideas. Maybe it was because of his intellectual background, his formal theological training. He had a keen mind, real good theological mind. He was bold. He was zealous. And so God picked him, maybe, uh, to, to do his will, to become an ambassador, not only to the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. But the bottom line is we really don't know all of the reason why God did it in the way that he did it as described here in this passage we just read in Acts chapter 26. Verse 12 says, On one of these journeys... I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, O king, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. 
we all fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. And so Jesus did something extremely unusual after his resurrection and ascension. He appeared in person to Saul of Tarsus in a very miraculous and vivid way, a, a blinding way, as, as Paul went away blinded. Now, what, what happened to the companions, I don't know. Uh, but this experience was such a vis, vivid and real experience that it changed Saul of Tarsus forever. He realized beyond a shadow of a doubt that he had met the risen Lord, the very person that was the cause of his persecution of Christians. Wow. Imagine the reflection, the mental reflection that would have taken place after that. As you go home and you go to bed, after, after having such an experience and meeting, having Christ speak to you and reveal himself to you, and you go home and realize, you know what? I've had hundreds beaten. I'm guessing hundreds. I don't know how many. Even if it's only 10 or 20. I've had people beaten because they were followers of this Jesus. I've cast in my vote for the death of some of the followers of Jesus. I persecuted the followers of Jesus. And yet now I know he's real. Well, what would take place in your mind at that point in time? But what we see is it took this kind of divine intervention to heal the brokenness of this very religious person. And it takes the same kind of intervention, maybe not in the same manner, but it takes a divine work of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit of God and the life of the individual to bring about the new birth that repairs our brokenness, that restores our relationship with the living God and gives us the ability to mend our brokenness. And I said amend our brokenness because although our brokenness is in a sense healed at the time of salvation, there are still the ramifications of what sin has done in our life. There's still the brokenness. And the rest of our journey in life is overcoming that. It's seeking to learn to walk with Jesus and to live more and more holy as time goes on and to correct the mistakes of the past and now to live in a manner that is truly, truly pleasing to God. Because the moment we come to Christ, as Paul did here, or as Saul, whichever we want to call him, did here, things change. Things change. There was an evident, there was a, a drastic change in the life of Saul of Tarsus so that this person who was at one time the greatest persecutor of the Christian faith becomes the greatest preacher of the Christian faith. And when the Lord Jesus Christ comes into our life, there will be a change. There will be a mending. And there will be a repairing process that begins to take place as we seek to live in a manner that is truly pleasing to God. And once we come to Christ, we will know what that way is. Because we were once formerly spiritually dead, but now we are alive in Christ. Once we were blind, but now we see. Once we could not understand the scriptures, but now we can understand the scriptures. Now we can know what truly pleases the Lord and how to live for Him. Where formerly that wasn't possible. We were too broken. We were so broken, we didn't know how to do that. And that's why it takes the divine work of the Spirit of God in the life of the individual, what we call the new birth, what Jesus called the new birth, where we accept Christ as our personal Lord and Savior by faith. We trust in Him and what He did on the cross and His death, burial, and resurrection. And when we do that, we become new creations in Christ. Behold, Old things pass away and all things become new. Secondly, secondly, we see in this narrative a vivid portrayal then of the cure for our spiritual brokenness. It is Christ and it is Christ alone. Nothing else can take the place of Christ. Nothing else can cause the transformation that is needed in the life of broken individuals, broken humanity. Nothing else can mend the effects of sin. Only Christ can break through our brokenness and mend it. Only Christ can grant you forgiveness. Only Christ can give a restored relationship with the living God. Only Christ can open your eyes to the truth of his word. Only Christ can help you. Only Christ. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man comes to the Father 
but by me. There is no other way to be healed, spiritually healed, of our brokenness other than through the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. The third thing that we learn from this passage in Acts is that God uses broken people to spread the gospel. You know, what's amazing to me is that, that God took this man who was killing Christians at one time and then used him to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that gives me hope. That gives me hope that if Paul can use somebody who declared himself to be chief among sinners, then he can use me. And he can use you to accomplish his purposes. And so Paul writes to those at Corinth these, these words in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. He says, To wit that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassador, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. To wit that God was in the world, in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, and now has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. God wants to use you to spread the gospel message, to tell others about Jesus Christ, regardless of the past, regardless of the brokenness that may be still in your life, that's still being mended by the work of the Holy Spirit and by the work of God. Christ wants to use you. Christ wants to use us. Let's pray. With heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around, this Easter Sunday morning, I want to ask the most important question that can be asked. And I hope that you have the right answer to that most important question. If you were to die today and stand at the gates of heaven and Jesus were to say to you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? If you were to say, well, because I'm a pretty good person or because I try to keep the commandments or because I go to church, in fact, I go to your church, Pastor Dean, <laughs> or because I've been baptized, or if you list anything that you have done, the Bible says that that falls short of salvation. The Bible says it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saves us. In Ephesians 2.8 it says, For by grace, for by grace, unmerited favor, are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The only way that you can be saved this morning, the only way that your sins can be forgiven, the only way that you can have a home in heaven, the only way that you can have assurance of eternal life, the only way that the brokenness in our lives can be repaired is through trusting in Christ, through faith in Him. If you've never done that before, what better time than this Easter Sunday morning? as we celebrate the resurrection of the living Christ, the same Christ that appeared to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. You say, well, how do I do that? You do that by faith. You do that by putting your trust in Christ and what he did for you on the cross. You may want to ex express that with a simple prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. Right now, the best I know how, I'm putting my faith and my trust in you and what you did on the cross of Calvary for me, in your death for me, in your burial and resurrection. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins and give me eternal life. I'm putting all of my faith and all of my trust in you, not in myself, but in you. If that was your prayer this morning and you meant it from your heart, would you raise your hand and just sort of wave at me for a moment? And just raise it and let me know that you prayed that prayer and you put your faith in Christ. Is there anyone? Okay. Is there anyone else? Anyone else that's saying this morning, Pastor Dean, I trusted Christ as my Savior. Father in heaven, I, I pray that all of us, everybody here, knows Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. And that Father... For those of us who do know him as we attempt to go through the rest of our lives until the day you take us home to glory, help us to overcome the effects of sin in our life.
the brokenness that exists that sometimes we are even unaware of or, or sometimes we fail to admit. The brokenness that we can pick out easily in the lives of others but don't discern in our own lives. Father, help us to overcome that by the power of your Holy Spirit who now indwells us if we believe in Christ. Help us to become Christ-like in this life. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he ever lives to intercede on our behalf and that even as we continue to make mistakes, as our faults continue sometimes, as we sin, he ever lives to intercede for us. We thank you for Easter. We thank you that Christ is alive. We thank you that he loves us and that he gave his life for us. In Jesus' name, amen. But take heart, I have overcome the world. They will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them, because He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and with Him will be His called, chosen, and faithful followers. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority, through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages and forevermore. Amen. They wept, the morning sun was dead, the Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, His blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon Him. final breath he gave as heaven looked away the son of god was laid in darkness the body on the grave the war on death was waged this power of hell forever broken
Kristen and Julia and Michael and the choir, thank you for leading us in worship this morning. Well, I'd like to close with a benediction, a passage of scripture that says, Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his throne, to only wise God, our Savior, to the Lord Jesus Christ, be both power and glory and honor forever. He is risen. He is risen risen indeed. indeed. Lord Jesus, dismiss us with your blessings and help us to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his resurrection and his intercession. In his name we pray. Amen.